And let me say that we'll be moving now from real solutions to real problems, to possible solutions for real problems, hopefully to be implemented by the many young people sitting in this room, because we are nowhere near finding the right answers as of now. I will say two things before I start. We had Professor Sahu talk about finding gaps in the fields. I'm gonna talk about finding fields in the gaps. And we had Dr. Ganga Khekar talk about, you know, how sometimes research can be a luxury for a poor country. I will say that in emerging technologies, forming a sunrise sector, where the economic growth is going to come from, not doing research is a luxury you cannot afford. Anytime you speak about emerging technologies, you have to be humble in the sense that you're like a man rowing a boat. You can only look backwards as you move forwards, and the route that you have traversed does not always tell you what's gonna happen in the future. So you have to be very thoughtful about what you do. And this is somewhere where you know natural sciences need social sciences to bring context regarding what is really needed. Why AI and genomics together? If you take Paul Sonier's book on the fourth revolution and you look at digital health, he speaks of it as a convergence of the digital revolution, which includes AI, and also the genomics revolution. What could be more digital than an editable human genetic code? Today, you can read, write, edit genomes. Even your genomes are fundamentally digital. And when you speak about what really makes AI AI, it's not the mathematics or the computing. If you look at when neural networks were invented, you will go back to the 1980s. It is the massive amounts of data that has become available to computers. That allows them to learn at a level that things happen, which almost look like natural human intelligence. We are there very far, but they are starting to look like natural human intelligence. It's the data and the digital revolution that makes AI, not the algorithms that have been around mostly for 30 years. And of course, computing matters. Your little, those of you carrying an iPhone or a Galaxy, packs more computing power than Deep, uh, you know, Deep Blue, which beat Gary Kasparov a long time ago. To think about what these technologies might mean to the future of health, especially to those of you who are natively digital and growing up, we had a Lancet Financial Times Commission, which I happened to co-chair, and we realized the applications of AI in health will not be what old people think. When old people think about current and future disease, we think about hypertension, we think of diabetes, we think of heart disease. When young people think about AI and what they want out of AI, they want communities, mental health, even sexual health. I mean, these are the priorities of young people. So when you imagine as a national priority going forward in a young nation, you must remember it is not about old people's disease. It's about things important to young people and mental health will be very, very important. India has made a great start. We have built the basic pillars. Unlike many other countries, we have a well-articulated, we have a well-articulated national digital health mission. We are further along the road of digital transformation than many well-developed nations. People speak of global norths and global souths, the haves and the have-nots. It's no longer true. India is better positioned to lead digital transformation of health than many other nation because digital transformation of health cannot be separated from digital transformation of society. It's the same basic essence that you use in India as further along. But we must recognize that when we say India is further along, we still have digital divides. The pictures on the top left are also India the pictures on the bottom left are also India. In some parts of India, we are only a digitization. Everything is analog, then it is scanned. Some parts of India, like hospitals, are digitalized. The data is initially generated in digital formats. Only a few parts of India are truly digitally transformed, 
where everything, including your ID, you know, COVID was a great example, COVID was a great example, vaccination was a great example. That was a digitally transformed effort. We must make sure that all of India gradually moves to the benefits of digital transformation. And that's a national priority. Not all of this will be good. Data is data. Bias in data cannot be removed by unbiasedly collecting data. That's something every epidemiologist knows. There are fundamental biases in data itself. The best example that I know of is from the study of Obermeyer in Science 2019, where they looked at an algorithm that was used by insurance companies to predict which patient was going to get sicker and give them additional care. Very interestingly, one day when they were splitting it by blacks and whites, they found that for every score on the algorithm, blacks, the darker color, had to be sicker with more active conditions to get the same score. Now, why is that? Algorithms are not biased. They don't care about the color of your skin. If you look deeper, how do you know anybody is sick? You know people are sick when they go to see a doctor. You know that people are sick when money is spent on their health care. The algorithm is not antaryami. Algorithm looks at the same indicators. And poor people become sicker before they see doctors. So an AI algorithm looking at health expenditure and health service utilization as a measure of sickness makes a black person sicker before he gets the same score on the algorithm. Imagine this in India. Imagine this on data coming out from the Ayushman Bharat mission. Imagine how wrong we will go. How wrong we will go without even realizing what the algorithms are doing to us. So be careful. And that's the message for the young people here because you are the ones going to die it. Now moving quickly to the end, the genomics part. All of you know the people on the left. They got the Nobel Prize, so everybody knows them, the CRISPR. Fewer people amongst you know the person on the right. She is Helen Hobbs. Helen Hobbs looked at low cholesterol in black people in Texas. Those of you who have been in Texas, a red meat country. Black people's diet is poor people's diet, more red meat. She found the people who had low cholesterol in that population had a mutation in a gene called PCSK9. That mutation can be artificially induced now, and that can lead to stable low cholesterol and low risks in monkeys for three years. Now we are at the point where we can change genomes from normal to better. Better is a very better word. When will we do it? Will we do it in a heritable manner? If you do it in a heritable manner, you will truly create classes. Today, caste is not biological, it is social political. But if you start tampering with the genomes, you will end up with real castes. Many of these questions are not science alone. They're really about humanities. Those of you worried about technical problems, that's not it. Eventually, we will solve them. The real issue is we have to ask, in all these priorities for the nation, will it let future generations flourish? Will it let all of you, the young people in this room, flourish and accomplish what you want to do? And to my mind, any debate on national priorities in emerging technologies like AI and genomics cannot be separated from them. Universities like symbiosis, where sciences, social sciences, well, they're both sciences, arts, all come together, are places where this debate must grow. And I'm really glad I'm here today. My parting thoughts, never forget basic science, never forget social science. There is no medical science, there is no health science without them. And you cannot translate what you do not know. Thank you all.